three kinds of fat. This is from Dr. Simeon's Pounds and Inches that you all need to read before you go on the diet and ask a bunch of questions. Questions are always good, though. All right. In the human body, we can distinguish three kinds of fat. The first is the structural fat, which fills the gaps be between various organs, a sort of packing material. Structural fat also performs such important functions as bedding the kidneys in soft, elastic tissue, protecting the coronary arteries, and keeping the skin smooth and taut. It also provides the springy cushion of hard fat under the bones of the feet, without which we would be unable to walk. The second type of fat is a normal reserve of fuel upon which the body can freely draw when the nutritional income from the intestinal tract is insufficient to meet the demand. Such normal reserves are localized all over the body. Fat is a substance which packs the highest caloric value into the smallest space so that normal reserves of fuel for muscular activity and the maintenance of body temperature can be most economically stored in this form. Both these types of fat, structural and reserve, are normal, and even if the body stocks them to capacity, this can never be called obesity. But there's a third type of fat which is entirely abnormal, abnormal, I said. It is the accumulation of such fat and of such fat only from which the overweight patient suffers. This abnormal fat is also a potential reserve of fuel, but unlike the normal reserves, it is not available to the body in a nutritional emergency. It is, so to speak, locked away in a fixed deposit and is not kept in a current account as are the normal reserves. When an obese patient tries to reduce by starving himself, he will first lose his normal fat reserves. When these are exhausted, he begins to burn up structural fat and only as a last resort will the body yield its abnormal reserves, though by that time the patient usually feels so weak and hungry that the diet is abandoned. It is just for this reason that obese patients complain that when they diet, they lose the wrong fat. They feel famished and tired and their face becomes drawn and haggard, but their belly, hips, thighs, and upper arms show little improvement. The fat that the fat they have come to detest stays on and the fat they need to cover their bones gets less and less. Their skin wrinkles and they look old and miserable. And that is one of the most frustrating and depressing experiences a human being can have. Injustice to the obese. Okay. We all know what this is about, don't we? Well, if you just eat less, you'll, you'll be fine. When these obese patients are accused of cheating, gluttony, lack of willpower, greed, and sexual complexes, the strong become indignant and decide that modern medicine is a fraud and its representatives fools, while the weak just give up the struggle in despair. In either case, the result is the same, a further gain in weight, resignation to an abominable, abominable fate, and the resolution at least to live to live tolerably the short span allotted to them, a fig for doctors and insurance companies. Obese patients only feel physically well as long as they are stationary or gaining weight. They may feel guilty owing to the lethargy, lethargy and indolence always associated with obesity. They may feel ashamed of what they have been led to believe is a lack of control. They may feel horrified by the appearance of their nude body and the tightness of their clothes, but they have a primitive feeling of animal content which turns to misery and suffering as soon as they make a resolute attempt to reduce. For this, there are sound reasons. In the first place, more caloric energy is required to keep a large body at a certain temperature than to heat a small body. Secondly, the muscular effort of moving a heavy body is greater than in the case of a light body. The muscular effort consumes calories which must be provided by food. Thus, all other factors being equal, a fat person requires more food than a lean one. One might therefore reason that if a fat person eats only the additional food his body requires, he should be able to keep his weight stationary. 
Yet every physician who has studied these obese patients under rigorously controlled conditions knows that this is not true. Many obese patients actually gain weight on a diet which is calorically deficient for their basic needs. There must thus be some other mechanism at work. Glandular theories. At one time it was thought that this mechanism might be concerned with the sex glands. Such connection was suggested by the fact that many juvenile obese patients show an underdevelopment of the sex organs. The middle age spread in men and the tendency of many women to put on weight in the menopause seem to indicate a causal connection between diminishing sex function and overweight. Yet when highly active sex hormones became available, it was found that their administration had no effect whatsoever on obesity. The sex glands could therefore not be the seat of the disorder. The thyroid gland. When it was discovered that the thyroid gland controls the rate at which body fuel is consumed, it was thought that by administering thyroid gland to, the, to obese patients, their abnormal fat deposits could be burned up more rapidly. This too proved to be entirely disappointing because as we now know, these abnormal deposits take no part in the body's energy turnover. They are inaccessibly locked away. Thyroid medication merely forces the body to consume its normal fat reserves, which are already depleted in obese patients, and then to break down structurally essential fat without touching the abnormal deposits. In this way, a patient may be brought to the brink of starvation in spite of having a hundred pounds of fat to spare. Thus, any weight loss brought about by thyroid medication is always at the expense of fat of which the body is in dire need. While the majority of these patients have a perfectly normal thyroid gland and some even have an overactive thyroid, one also occasionally sees a case with a real thyroid deficiency. In such cases, treatment with thyroid brings about a small loss of weight, but this is not due to the loss of any abnormal fat. It is entirely the result of the elimination of a mucoid substance called myxedema, M-Y-X-E, D -E -M -A, which the body accumulates when there is a marked primary thyroid deficiency. Moreover, patients suffering only from a severe lack of thyroid hormone never become obese in the true sense. Possibly also the observation that normal persons, though not the obese, lose weight rapidly when their thyroid becomes overactive may have contributed to the false notion that thyroid deficiency and obesity are connected. That didn't make much sense. Oh well. Much misunderstanding about the supposed role of the thyroid gland in obesity is still met with, and it is now really high time that thyroid preparations be once and for all struck off the list of remedies for obesity. This is particularly so because giving thyroid gland to an obese patient whose thyroid is either normal or overactive, besides being useless, is decidedly dangerous. Okay, I'm going to stop now. Next video will be on the pituitary gland. Bye.